One Health Initiative, and our website is at the bottom of this page. Um, for the since 2000, for all news and information pertaining to One Health. So please visit it and tell your friends and colleagues to visit it. Uh, it's a labor of love for us, and uh, we are very eager to um, share all news and information about One Health with you. So you may or may not be aware that the One Health concept is very simply that human, animal, environmental, and ecosystem health are linked. And so this concept then, while it seems straightforward and obvious, is generally not what we do in academia, government, or industry. This, this, com, uh, this concept then uh, helps us to examine complex subjects such as food security and antimicrobial resistance. I'm going to focus my comments today for the sake of time just on antimicrobial resistance, but it is very much linked up with food security as well. We must examine all aspects of our lives if we are to live in our world more sustainably. And let's not forget that we interact with our environment every single day by inhaling the air, drinking the water, and ingesting the plants and animals that we call food. So we are literally taking in the environment into our bodies every day. And you can't get a more profound interaction than that. Okay, and so now my uh, computer has frozen up. Um, hold on one second. See. My apologies. Can somebody share their screen? Uh, Sean, do you have my presentation? Yeah, do you want me to share it on your behalf? Yeah, could you share it on my behalf? Because yeah. I'm afraid this is going to happen repeatedly. No worries. Let's hope my internet holds up. Just give me a Hopefully moment. Hopefully yours doesn't freeze up. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, just let me pull it up. Okay. Right. Just let me know when you can see it. Okay, great. So if you can go to the next there. slide. Next slide. Terrific, thank you. Just stay on that for right now. So my colleagues in Sweden, One Health Sweden, and my colleague, Dr. Bruce Kaplan, uh, developed this umbrella graphic to illustrate the One Health concept. And admittedly, it's rather busy. Um, you can come, but it's useful and uh, it, you can come to One Health in a variety of different ways, depending on your interests. So I come to it from the zoonotic infection side, looking at bio threats, global health, antimicrobial resistance. And again, that bubble on antimicrobial resistance is going to be what I'm gonna talk about today. But for those of you who are interested in comparative medicine, translational medicine, the other side of the umbrella, if you will, um, it's very important to be aware that disease processes across species are shared. And in fact, some of the greatest discoveries in the history of medicine and public health have been at that intersection between human and animal health. So uh, those of us in medicine have become very uh, siloed, very focused, very reductionistic in how we approach health and disease by just looking at the microscopic aspects of it rather than looking at the big picture. So for those of you in veterinary medicine, you're very aware of this. Uh, but for those of us in human medicine, uh, we have a lot to learn from the veterinarians. Next slide, please. So let's now talk about antimicrobial resistance. Next slide. So Sir Alexander Fleming was very prescient when he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his discovery of penicillin. And he said that the time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there is the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistant. And indeed that is uh, what we are uh, confronting today. 
uh, in, a, in a very large scale, unfortunately. So he anticipated this uh, problem from the very early days, uh, and unfortunately, he was correct. Next slide, please. So I think it's important to recognize that antimicrobials are the foundation of modern medicine and veterinary medicine. Uh, you can't have elective surgeries, cancer chemotherapies, a lot of the therapies that we take for granted, including immunosuppressive therapies for uh, chronic diseases, autoimmune diseases, without having effective antimicrobials because the risk for infection becomes too high. Now, when I talk about antimicrobials, you can have antibiotics for bacteria, antivirals against viruses, antiparasitic agents, and antifungals. And there can always be uh, resistance, but for the sake of this talk, I'm just going to focus on bacteria and antibiotics. Next slide, please. So antimicrobial resistance is very much a One Health issue. It, it affects humans, animals, and the entire globe, the environments and the ecosystems. And um, I, people sometimes, I think, use the term environment and ecosystem interchangeably, but they're actually quite different. And um, hopefully we can get some discussion on that during the Q&A session. Next slide, please. So we live in a microbial world. I think it's important that everybody recognize that, that we live in a microbial world, that our bodies are mostly microbial. We have more microbes on us and in us than we have human cells. And this is the situation for other animals and for plants as well. Um, we have what's called our microbiome, the collective term for the microbes that live on us and in us, and they are as important for our health and well being as any of our organs. And when we eat, we are feeding our microbes. So, depending on what you feed them, you can either feel well or you can feel sick. Um, microbes like a very high fiber diet, they like the fruits and the vegetables. They don't do well with highly refined foods and lots of refined sugar. Uh, so that's one of the many reasons why sugar is so unhealthy for us. But think about your poor microbes that you're feeding there. They're uh, dependent on what you feed them. Uh, this book here by Dr. Paul Falkowski at Rutgers University is very interesting about how microbes made the world habitable. If you're interested in that, if you're interested in a more global view, uh, I recommend that book. And, and uh, again, animals and plants have their own microbiomes too. So, you know, these microbes get around as this pandemic has shown us. Uh, and um, we have to live in it more uh, better. We have to figure out how to live in it better to live in it more sustainably. Next slide, please. So let me just briefly talk about the human aspects of antimicrobial resistance. Um, there's been certainly benefits and risks with antibiotics. They've saved many lives, uh, but they do come with risks, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Uh, they can adversely affect microbiomes. Uh, they, uh, antibiotics will affect indiscriminately the good bacteria with the bad, uh, and that can have long-term health consequences. Human waste carries antimicrobial resistance genes and resistant bacteria. And antibiotic use varies dramatically become, uh, between countries uh, and has increased and worsened the uh, problem of antimicrobial resistance. Next slide, please. So as I said, uh, antibiotics are adversely affecting microbiomes. And uh, this book by Dr. Martin Blazer, uh, an infectious disease physician, formerly at New York University, now at Rutgers University, uh, is a fascinating book, and he's done a fair amount of research looking at the impact of antibiotics uh, and the rise of certain chronic diseases, including food allergies, obesity, asthma, and others. Again, the unintended consequences of antibiotics on our microbiomes has been affecting our health and our well being. So, a uh, very uh, interesting book, highly worth 
reading. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, antibiotic prescribing patterns vary dramatically across countries. So, you know, you think that um, the prescription of it is factual, but in actuality, it's very much cultural. The practice of medicine, the practice of veterinary medicine, how likely you are to prescribe antibiotics is very much influenced by who your teachers are and what your patients are demanding. Uh, so, for example, uh, just in Europe, um, they've done studies looking at certain antibiotic prescribing, and they find that the countries in the Mediterranean region prescribe antibiotics much more frequently than uh, countries in the Scandinavian region. And again, that appears to be cultural. So um, worth, worth understanding, you know, why are these cultural variations impacting the practice of medicine and, veter very, uh, and veterinary medicine? Um, it's very hard to study because people don't like having their, you know, practices analyzed in that way. But, you know, what is the optimum prescribing of antibiotics? Next slide, please. They've, uh, antibiotics has also increased with time over many countries. And you can see in this graph that particularly in low and lower middle income countries, uh, the prescription rates have increased with time and the upper middle income countries as well. High income countries, it appears to be much uh, flatter uh, in terms of the overall trends. Next slide, please. And as uh, Sir Alexander Fleming warned us that if you can go into a shop and purchase antibiotics and use them uh, for any sniffle, the risk for worsening resistance increases. And indeed, uh, in this study done in 2011, many countries provide antibiotics. They sell them over the counter without a prescription. People can just walk in and buy whatever they want. Uh, without really thinking about the consequences, not only to their health, uh, but to the worsening trend of antimicrobial resistance. So uh, addressing this is easier said than done because again, uh, health is cultural. Uh, and some countries have better healthcare systems than others. Um, some countries have an extensive primary care network and others rely on antibiotics as their primary care network. I mean, we really have to do a much better job um, in terms of understanding the whole microbial world and, and how we're going to uh, address it. infections and uh, the use of antibiotics. And there'll be more of that. Because this is such a One Health approach, you will see more of a connection there as I move on with this talk. Next slide, please. So the animal aspects of antimicrobial resistance. Well, like with humans, uh, animals will, you know, if they get sick, they get antibiotics and that comes with its benefits and risks. It, they also affect animal microbiomes. And again, with humans, uh, veterinary use of prescribing of antimicrobials varies by country. Uh, and I think it's important to uh, recognize that it's not only food animals, it's not only livestock that um, receive antibiotics, it's also companion animals as well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, antibiotic use in food animals, again, livestock consume most of the world's antibiotics, uh, and this rise will increase with increasing meat consumption, uh, particularly in countries in Asia. Uh, you can see the rise of global meat production. This goes along with global meat consumption. Um, and uh, there's actually more antibiotics used in food animals now than in uh, human medicine. Next slide, please. I'm afraid uh, that I missed a slide here. I, I had a different, another slide. Um, let me, uh, let me just, um, can you, uh, 
Um, you want me to stop sharing and then you yeah, can share for, you for one slide? Yeah, sharing for one minute because there was a slide that I wanted to share and talk about. And let me just bring that up. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to say that pets are generally ignored in the whole antimicrobial resistant discussion. Uh, and that's a major oversight because, you know, when we live in our homes, when we share our homes with our pets, they are part of our family, uh, but they share their microbiomes with us. Uh, and you can see that some people share their beds with their pets. Uh, they share their food with their pets, and you know we certainly do that with our pets. Um, there are a companion animals that visit people in the hospital. Uh, this is an example where they're visiting uh, ch children on an oncology ward, uh, and the uh, pet might be carrying methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Um, so, so this is a major issue that is a One Health issue that we need to work with the veterinarians and the physicians to make sure that particularly for people who are vulnerable, uh, the immunosuppressed or those who are going to be having surgery, uh, that they uh, are aware of these uh, potential risks with, uh, with their pets that may or may not be harboring resistant microbes, uh, and that could potentially then uh, serve as a problem for them, either post-op or uh, post-therapy. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a few slides. Let me see if I can, uh, okay. I'm just gonna present with this format if that's okay. So let me just talk a bit about the environmental and the ecosystem aspects of antimicrobial resistance because it's huge, it's profound, and we generally don't talk about it. But the soil microbes are the ones where we've gotten um, most of our antibiotics from. And uh, these soil microbes are very hard to uh, grow in laboratories for a variety of reasons. Most of what goes on under the surface of the soil, we have no idea. But for many years, we thought that the, the bacteria in the soil use antibiotics as a form of chemical warfare against each other. Uh, but that with improvements in science and technology, uh, we've discovered that that's, that's actually not the case. The case is, that they are using minute quantities of antibiotics as a form of communication with each other. Um, and so uh, our blasting of the environment with antibiotics with our, through our wastes and all is changing the biome of the planet in ways that we don't really understand. Um, so the other thing that's important to realize is that antibiotic resistance is ancient and it's everywhere. Now, as I said, we don't know what goes on under the surface of the soil, but what scientists came up with this brilliant strategy of extracting DNA directly from the soil, it's called metagenomics. And so they can look at this genetic material, uh, they can examine what it is. Now, they don't know from what microbe the genetic material came from, but nevertheless, that is the genetic material that is there. And what they found is that resistance genes are everywhere and they appear to be ancient. And in fact, they found four million year old bacteria in ancient caves resistant to many antibiotics. Now they've never been exposed to any human anthropogenic exposure, but yet in some of these remote caves, uh, in areas in the Arctic and the Antarctic, there's resistant bacteria. So this isn't just a result of our using antibiotics. Resistance is already in the environment. Uh, hold on a second. So this whole resistant environment then has been called the global resistome. Uh, and the global resistome then profoundly impacts our challenge of dealing with antimicrobial resistance in the clinical setting in both humans and animals. 
and plants as well. Um, so we have to recognize this when we talk about antimicrobial resistance. So then how are humans adversely impacting the global resistome? Well, through poor sanitation, and I'll talk more about that, indiscriminate antibiotic use, again, many countries allow antibiotics to be sold over the counter, untreated human and animal waste uh, because it's filled with resistant bacteria and genes, uh, and that waste contaminates lands and water, and the spread of resistant microbes and genes by wildlife. Um, they, they carry it, uh, particularly birds, because they fly long distances. So um, I think we also have to recognize that antibiotic use on crops is widespread. And they are used extensively on fruit, such as apples and pears. They've been used for decades. Um, there's very little apparent oversight of antibiotic use on crops. Uh, and this one study done by the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the World Animal Health Organization found that only 3% out of 158 countries that they studied has any type of regular assessment of this practice. Another major crop receiving antibiotics is rice. And rice is used by a huge number, a huge fraction of the global population, uh, particularly in Asia. So antimicrobial resistance then can be spread in many ways, but it can also be spread by food. So not only through our waste, but through the direct contamination of food and through the use of antibiotics on food. Um, filth flies, here's an environmental factor that we generally don't think of, but flies can also spread antimicrobial resistance. So then, from a One Health perspective then, on antimicrobial resistance, it's all connected. We need to look at this in a, both a, the human perspective, animal, and the environmental perspective, if we hope to get a handle on addressing it. So now, how much of human antimicrobial resistance comes from animals? Well, that's one of the things that I investigated in my book, one Health and the Politics of Antimicrobial Resistance, because there seemed to be a blame game going on between physicians and veterinarians as to who was more to blame for the rise of antimicrobial resistance. And the irony is that everybody's to blame. I mean, as we saw, this is a global issue. It's in the environment, it's ancient, and, and our use in both medicine, veterinary medicine, and on crops is all contributing to it. So it's it's an enormous issue. Um, you can't really pinpoint one microbe or, you know, or, or who's at risk. But uh, one of the things that I discovered in researching this book is that there was one microbe that seemed to really highlight the problem of antimicrobial resistance. And that was the uh, microbe called VRE or vancomycin resistant antimicrobial uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus specium, or VRE for short. Uh, and that microbe, it was assumed that the cause was from growth promoter use in livestock. But it turns out when they used uh, whole genome sequencing, when that became available, it turned out that it looked like dogs were actually the reservoir of VRE through uh, their uh, genetic precursor ampicillin resistant enterococcus specium and not food animals. So you can make all sorts of assumptions as to who's the cause or who's the culprit of the rise of this particular microbe. But if you don't look at the entire genome, you can be completely off the mark in terms of uh, who's, you know, what's, what's the problem here. Now, the other issue in terms of the environment, and this is a really important study, the estimation of global recoverable human and animal fecal biomass done by Berendis and colleagues, published in Nature Sustainability in 2018. They did this study where they looked at 7.4 billion humans, the whole global human population, and 30 billion domesticated food animals, and figured out how much fecal mass everybody uses. 
Uh, and they estimated that about 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter are produced. Animals produce about 80% of it. Now to put this into perspective, 4 trillion kilograms or kilograms would fill about 1.6 million Olympic-sized swimming pools every single year. Or to think of it another way, you could, if you took all of it and dumped it on New York City, I'm not suggesting anybody do this because I live here, <laughs> uh, you dump it all on New York City, it would cover New York City up to 16 feet of poop, you know, the entire surface area. So that's a lot and we produce it every year much of it is used on agricultural fields as fertilizer, but you've got to ask, well, how much is too much? How much fecal matter do we need? And most of the sanitation systems only process human fecal matter. They don't include animal fecal matter. So you've got a lot of raw animal fecal matter in the environment, and they contain a lot of pathogens uh, that then contaminate uh, food and water. So when you get foodborne illness, waterborne illness, diarrheal illnesses, people get sick, and then they start taking more antibiotics. And then you start getting this vicious cycle in. So the root then, I think, of dealing with antimicrobial resistance is we have to address all of our wastes of the environment that are contaminating the environment and then getting us sick. Um, so that is a key part of it, of antimicrobial resistance rather than, of course, we need to use ju antibiotics judiciously, but it's hard to deny somebody who's sick a treatment. The other thing that's really interesting is, well, not only are the animals defecating outdoors, but you've got a lot of people who are defecating outdoors, open, called open defecation. Uh, some countries have a lot more open defecation than others, India has about 60% of the people who openly defecate, and they have some of the most resistant microbes in the world. This study here on global antibiotic consumption, an analysis of pharmaceutical data, was very interesting because for some inexplicable reason, Australia and New Zealand had the highest antibiotic consumption per person of almost any country in the world. And you think, why Australia and New Zealand? Well, one possible explanation is when you look at the country level animal to human fecal ratio, Australia and New Zealand stand out. They've got a lot more animals. They've got a lot of sheep. They're defecating in the environment, contaminating the environment. The people get sick and they're taking antibiotics. So that might be an explanation for why Australia and New Zealand have some of the highest antibiotic consumption in the world, because they have such a high density of, uh, of animal to human fecal ratio. Uh, they are not the largest in terms of absolute. There are other countries that have more fecal, animal fecal production, world fecal produ production, if you will, but in terms of hum animal to human ratio, they stand out. So this definitely needs more research in terms of fecal matter in the environment and antibiotic consumption. What is the relationship there? Um, so let's talk, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about potential antibiotic alternatives. Because as I said earlier, antibiotics have saved many lives, but they've also come, in addition to the benefits, there are many risks. Antibiotics are broad spectrum generally, they're killing the good with the bad. So there are some alternatives, preventive strategies through vaccination, for example. There's immunostimulants, bacteriophages, probiotics, micro, microbial, antimicrobial peptides, and similarly for animal use as well. But let me talk a bit about uh, bacteriophages because I find them particularly interesting. Now in nature, they are the natural foes of bacteria. And since the dawn of, you know, the dawn of uh, life on the planet, there appears or appears to be kind of a a constant battle going on between phages and bacteria. 
Now, phages are highly specific. They will only target a specific bacteria. And that has its pluses and minuses because you don't deal with the collateral damage of a damaged microbiome. But in terms of using them as a therapeutic, it means that you can't just kind of, you can't just blindly prescribe them and hope for the best. You have to know exactly what you're treating. Uh, and that requires then very effective uh, rapid diagnostics, very accurate, valid, rapid diagnostics to know exactly what you're treating. The CRISPR-Cas9 system is the bacterial immune system against phages. The phages evolve with the bacteria, so resistance becomes less of a problem because the phages evolve as the bacteria evolve. They are the most prevalent bioform on the planet called the virosphere. Um, there have been some approved products here in the US for food safety use on the market. Um, Again, there's a lot of issues. Using them would be akin to a personalized cancer therapy where you have to identify the exact cause before you can uh, initiate treatment. So it would necessitate a change in how medicine and veterinary medicine were practiced. It would necessitate knowing exactly what you're treating, and that's very expensive, uh, labor-intensive, and time-consuming. So. It's not ready for prime time yet. And I think of it kind of like green energy. For many years, wind and solar power were not ready for use uh, you know, on a large scale, but with a lot of investment and time, we're getting there. Uh, I think with phages and with other alternatives besides antibiotics, I think it might be a more sustainable strategy than dealing with the whole problem of antimicrobial resistance because it is such a huge problem on a global environmental ecosystem problem. Um, again, the pros and the cons here, um, they are highly specific, require rapid diagnostics. There are certain factors related to phages that are important to recognize. They can only be lytic and not lysogenic, uh, and I don't really have time to get into the differences between the two, but it's very important that you uh, know what you're dealing with. Uh, the good news, though, is that there's very low toxicity, little of any environmental impacts with antibiotics, and it doesn't really, it kind of bypasses the whole antimicrobial resistance issue. Now, the interesting thing, looking at this from an environmental perspective, um, some researchers, uh, Harvard researchers and their colleagues in Bangladesh were very interested to figure out the uh, climactic cause of cholera uh, outbreaks, um, how storms impact it, because it appears to impact perhaps the microbial ecosystems that ultimately impact human health. Uh, and so they collected waters uh, from lakes in Bangladesh. And they found a very interesting thing. They found that there was an inverse relationship between the Vibrio cholera bacteria and the Vibrio phages in the water. So there's normally a homeostasis between the two. And when a storm comes, that homeostasis gets disrupted. And it allows then the proliferation of the bacteria and you get a human outbreak of cholera. And it's not until the vibriophages, the bacteriophages, that can come back in and kill off some of the bacteria in the lakes, re-equilibrate that homeostasis, the cholera outbreak then disappears. So you can see that with this graph, this is the uh, cholera, uh, and it's inversely related to the concentration of the cholera phages or vibriophages in the water. Uh, here's some pictures of the vibriophages that they isolated from the environmental waters in Bangladesh. It's a very interesting paper published way back in 2005. Didn't get the attention I think it deserved, but I think it re is worth revisiting it. Uh, and then again, this is a schematic model of the influence of phages 
on the cholera seasonality uh, that you see um, after storms. The other thing that I highly recommend um, is this TED Talk. Dr. Stephanie Strathdee and her husband, Tom Patterson, at U uh, University of California, San Diego. They were on vacation in Egypt when he came down with a pan-resistant Acinetobacter baumani infection, had to be medevaced to San Diego and lay dying in the intensive care unit with a pan-resistant infection. There, no antibiotic could treat it. Dr. Strathtee, uh, who's an expert in global health, did some research and stumbled upon phages. And in desperation, she contacted some phage researchers around the country, and uh, they sent the specimen, uh, the, the husbands, the, the uh, bacteria, to the phage researchers. They worked round the clock for weeks uh, for a couple weeks. Uh, fortunately, he stayed alive during this time. But anyway, to make a long story short, they infused a cocktail into his abdomen where the infection was. They gave it to him intravenously. And three days later, he woke up and he was cured. So she talks about this amazing experience in this YouTube, uh, in this TED Talk. And she also wrote about it in her book, The Perfect Predator. But since then, uh, UC San Diego has now established a center for innovative phage applications and therapeutics, and there are now increasing numbers of cases of people who are being treated and, cure and saved uh, from their uh, multi-drug resistant infections using phages. So uh, again, the, uh, they're still very highly experimental, but um, there is, I think, some light at the end of the tunnel. So addressing antimicrobial resistance is essential to achieving the U United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and uh, you can see this, you can look at it on um, the uh, World Health Organization website on uh, Sustainable Development Goals. But it very much affects poverty, uh, food security, health, obviously, clean water and sanitation. Again, that is uh, key on this whole thing, really. Uh, the cost, if we don't address this, is going to be, they estimate, 100 trillion by 2050. Um, and, you know, we need to look at this in a very multidisciplinary way. So uh, we need to learn how to work with nature, not against it. If we want healthy people and sustainable societies, we need to recognize that we live in a microbial world. Our wastes are adversely impacting the world, both the soils, the water, and the air. We need to integrate our efforts to benefit humans, animals, environments, and ecosystems. And a One Health approach in medicine and veterinary medicine is essential. So um, I just want to uh, acknowledge my colleagues with the One Health Initiative. Please visit our website. And I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. Follow me on Twitter if you're interested, although lately I've been trying to, uh, trying to help save our democracy here in the United States. Uh, so I haven't been tweeting as much about One Health as I would like. But uh, anyway, thank you all so much for your time and attention and happy to answer any questions. So with that, I'm gonna stop my screen share. Thank you so much, Dr. Laura. That was really an interesting presentation. And thank you for sharing so many different facets of, I think, one of the more pertinent One Health issues that we're dealing with at the current moment. Um, so before <clears throat> we move on to the Q&A for today, um, we're gonna try something different with the attendance. So Andreas will be putting the link to mark your attendance in the chat at this moment so that you have time during this Q&A and also after to do it. I know because some people couldn't stay for the entire duration of the meeting for the last few days. So hopefully this helps to clear up um, some of the problems that you had in the previous days. Um, and so we can kick off the Q&A formally now. Um, I think our first question is by Margarita Demeskin and I will now I think our participants are happy to unmute themselves to ask a question, so I will let them do just that. Um, Margarita, you should be able to unmute yourself. 
Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Uh, hello. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was very useful and uh, nice. I followed really nicely throughout it. Um, my question is, it started at the beginning of the presentation as one question, but now I have more. <laughs> um, I'd like to know what can a simple individual, like a simple citizen with minimal to no background in medicine, what can this individual do to protect themselves against uh, antimicrobial, uh, um, against this resistance? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you for that, for that question. Um, you know, during a pandemic, it really makes us aware of the microbes in our environment. Um, and I, I think one of the things that's important is to, is to recognize the microbial world we live in. Um, if you have a pet, uh, always make sure to wash your hands after cleaning up after your pet. I mean, uh, I, I don't think people quite realize uh, the impact that their pets can have. And, and, I, and I'm, you know, I've got lots of pets, so I'm a strong advocate of owning pets because I really think that they help make our lives better. But, you know, we also have to recognize, uh, you know, some of the microbial issues that, that we have to deal with, um, as well as, uh, so, so there's that, there's the food aspect to it. Um, you wanna make sure that when you cook, that, uh, that you do it in as a hygienic, and sanitary way as possible, uh, particularly when using meats, because they can be covered with uh, contamination, fecal contamination. We always have to be aware of that. Uh, plants as well, but the risks are less so. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're cutting food, you use a, ideally a, a cutting board that you can wash well afterwards and I don't use meat on a wooden cutting board just minor things like that um, to try and think through how could I decrease the risk of microbial contamination in this environment um, I, I think would would help a lot um, certainly sanitation plumbing uh, you know we take it for granted in many parts of the world but in other parts of the world it's not available uh, and, and there are cultural aspects, but there are also infrastructure aspects that um, decrease their use. So, so these are all things that we need to talk about, particularly all of our fecal waste. Uh, I live here in New York City, and I'm always very diligent about picking up my dog's waste, but I walk around and a lot of people are not diligent about picking up their dog's waste, even though there's laws that you know, you're supposed to pick up after your dog. There's still dog waste on the sidewalks. So these are all things, and, and it's being a good global citizen, just making sure that you know, you're not contributing to the, the waste uh, because it affects everybody. I hope that addresses some of your question. Thank you for your response. Um, our next question is from Nobit on Yango. So I'm going to let you unmute yourself as well. Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Hello. I hope you're not. Sorry. Hi there. We can hear you, Nobit. Hello. You can ask your question if you like. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Laura. I had a question on. Uh, uh, in some sectors, you find that vets are usually blamed for antimicrobial resistance, but I think you addressed it in your presentation, so I think I'm okay. Hello? Hi, sorry, well, I'm sorry, what was the question? The question was about uh, the blame game, the blame game. Oh. Especially vets are usually blamed for antimicrobial resistance. Right. Especially they are, they are used, used as feed additives and in treatment of food animals, but I think you addressed it, so I'm okay now. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you very thing, much. Uh, for those of you who might be interested, I have a, a Coursera course on One Health Policy that you might be interested in, and um, I will share the link with you. Uh, it's been, um, it was released back in um, June of this year, 
uh, and it's got over 3,800 students from around the world, so please visit it. Um, and it also addresses, there's the link for the, uh, for the course, so uh, please visit it, and if you're interested, please take it. Um, it's meant for, it's, I had my students use the lectures for, for the class that I taught this, uh, this past fall. Um, it's the lectures that I use here at Princeton, at Princeton University. So um, happy to, uh, to share it all with you. Perfect. Um, our next question is from A. Spitzer. We'll just let you unmute yourself as well. Hi there. Good morning. Um, hello, how are you? Good. Good. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Khan. Um, by coincidence, I actually took your um, Coursera course last summer while we were all locked down. Oh, and <laughs> very excited that um, it's come full circle for me. Terrific. Thank you for taking it and for your interest. Um, as for my question, um, I think this is a very relevant given our current situation. What we've been doing is waiting for uh, these vaccines to roll out and be produced and distributed around the world. Uh, last summer, I recently read an article by the epidemiologist Rob Wallace and where he implicated um, advertising and the petrochemical industries in the unregulated use of antibiotics. Um, as to your research and discussions on the blame game, I was wondering if you have any insights about the role of markets on our consumption and what you think the drug manufacturers need to be do or to be included in our discussions on One Health? Sure. Um, petrochemical, in, in what way exactly are they involved uh, in terms of um, antimicrobial resistance? I'm a little confused on that connection that you... That well, you the, the way that it was described, I think, in the article, my understanding is that um, part of the production of chemicals and ultimately these drug derivatives involves um, using petroleum as an original source or as um, non-renewable um, base materials in order to have the manufacturing resources. Okay, um, I must admit I'm not familiar with that. Uh, there's, you know, there's a whole issue of trying to get the pharmaceutical industry interested in developing antimicrobials. You know, most of them have gotten out of the business uh, for uh, a variety of reasons, one of which um, is that it's hard to, it, it costs billions to develop a new antimicrobial, uh, and yet we don't we want to discourage the use of the new antimicrobials to try to save them. So there's a lot of economic factors, disincentives to the uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, to not want to develop antibiotics because it costs a lot of money. People only take them for a prescribed period of time and we want to try and reduce their use. So they would much rather uh, get a much better return on investment by developing drugs that people have to use for the rest of their lives, like antihypertensive drugs, cholesterol drugs, uh, you know, insulins, things like that. Um, so, uh, so that's that's a huge challenge, um, and there have been some acts passed here in the US to try to incentivize them, but it's not been great. Uh, and again, even if you develop a new antibiotic, there's still going to be eventually resistance to it. Um, you know, the bacteria are able to uh, evolve and mutate a lot faster than we can develop new antibiotics. Now there's other, other strategies, the small peptides uh, and things like that. But um, you know, I'm not sure how much uh, research and development is going on for that. And of course, you have to think about the safety element as well. 
So many, many factors going on. And, and I foresee that until we figure out how to live better in our microbial world, we're going to have you know, this kind of interspace period um, that, you know, unfortunately that we have to deal with um, trying to uh, save lives from infections while also, you know, not having the best uh, therapeutic armamentarium to, uh, to use. I foresee someday in the future, and this is just pure speculation on my part, because our microbiomes are so important, I foresee a day that when you go into the doctor's office, they'll do a microbial scan of you to, to see what your microbial situation is. Uh, and if there's you know, some adversities, maybe they'll prescribe a, a wash or a cocktail or something to ingest to try and get it back more into um, normal functioning. And of course our diet, what we eat has a huge impact on that. Um, there have been studies done uh, again, in uh, the uh, uh, wife, actually, of Dr. Martin Blazer has been doing research on uh, indigenous peoples in the Amazon and found that they have a much more diverse microbial uh, microbiome on their bodies, in their bodies, than those of us in developed countries. Um, so there's much that we have to learn. Uh, you know, this whole field of microbiome uh, research and uh, treatment is really in its infancy right now. So I, I see great changes taking place as we try to figure out what exactly does the microbiome entail? Um, you know, how can we ensure a healthy microbiome and how do we treat it, trying to keep the microbiome as intact as possible while treating uh, an infection. Um, and, and so that's gonna rethink really how medicine and veterinary medicine is practiced. And you know, people don't like change, often resistant to change. Um, so you know, I think this is going to be a generational, generational uh, effort, multi-generational. Thank you, Ace, for your question as well. Um, Dr. Laura, our next question is from Anishka Kemra, and I've just put it in chat because she's not able to ask it herself, but she's asking, how can a One Health approach facilitate more global collaboration on tackling AMR? Well, as, as I, I think what I've shown in my talk, this involves humans, animals, and the environment. We really need to get everybody to the table to talk about how can we address this in a strategic way. Because I, I think at the root of it, we need to figure out what to do with all of our fecal wastes. Because the fecal wastes seem to be driving a lot of the illness that demands more antibiotics. And so we're in a vicious cycle. Um, so at the very least, and, and you know, these are subjects that you know, the clinicians generally don't talk about because we're just so focused on what's going on in our clinic that we don't really think about, well, how is the larger environmental milieu impacting my patients. Um, veterinarians generally get that kind of training, but I can tell you in medicine, we don't. We're very, you know, kind of got the blinders on, just focused on the patient in the clinic, looking at their organ systems and not thinking about the environment they're living in. So we really need to start broadening our perspective if we want to uh, try to improve our health. Uh, and so, this requires, I think, global recognition and a, a drive by the practitioners that we need to change what we're doing. Uh, we need to have a healthier environment, healthier ecosystems if we want healthy people and animals. So it requires actually agriculture to be at the table as well. Thank you, Dr. Laura. Um, the next question is also by a participant who cannot ask it um, directly for themselves. So it's from Bumnut Kasahun, and the question is, what accelerates the emergence and spread of AMR? Um, well, again, antimicrobial resistance already exists in the environment. So it's already out there, and it's, and it's been there long before we ever showed up. 
So, but what's accelerating it is our, our use of it and our wastes that contain it. Um, that then interacts with the microbes in the environment uh, and it, uh, it influences them, it changes the global resistome. So we're dealing with a global resistome in a, in a very adverse way through our wastes and our indiscriminate use of antibiotics in humans, animals, and our crops. Uh, all of that together uh, is accelerating the emergence and spread of AMR. Thank you. Um, the next question is by Richard Seifman. Richard, I'm not sure if you saw my message, but I'm asking you to unmute yourself now if you'd like to, because um, you didn't mention if you were able to do it yourself, but I'll just give you a couple of seconds. If not, I'll read your question for you. Yes, I think I can. Um, oh, perfect, yeah. Hi, right. so, so my question really is um, the impact of the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, in terms of either heightening or diminishing uh, antimicrobial resistance, whether it be with regard to bad diagnosis and use of um, antimicrobials to respond to COVID, whether it's more pets um, as a result, whether it's um, increased hospitalization that generates the need for it. But also one other aspect that I would be curious as to your thinking. We know that COVID is not um, a bacteria, but it, we do know that it is, can be found in fecal waste. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that isn't a new avenue for those who see this as a very significant aspect to pursue. And I'll stop there. Thank you for your excellent lecture. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, I mean, I think this pandemic has, for the time being, distracted us from the whole AMR issue, certainly. Um, you're right, it is a, a viral pandemic. Um, and, and yes, uh, you can detect it in the fecal waste. Now, how that impacts AMR, it's unclear. But certainly, if you're in the hospital, and if your microbiome is disrupted by this virus, uh, that then makes you more susceptible to, say, a bacterial pneumonia or an infection, uh, and then necessitating the use of antibiotics. So, um, you know, they didn't, unfortunately, the U.S. government was a catastrophic failure in responding to this. But what I would have recommended for people who are 65 and older is for them to all get the pneumonia shot, the PEPFAR shot, uh, uh, to try and prevent pneumonia, to try and get their bodies in as good a shape as possible as this pandemic washes across our shores, um, because that is very much a risk. I mean, ideally, I mean, the best medicine is to prevent illness, uh, and vaccines are the best strategy we've got. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of anti-vaccination sentiment because people don't really understand them. Um, so, uh, you know, vaccinations could be a strategy to prevent bacterial infection, ideally, um, certainly. And, and now, fortunately, we've got uh, vaccines being rolled out against the virus. So, I mean, this is, again, all connected. And, um, you know, I, I think time, time will tell in terms of how much of an impact these wastes will have on the biome. But um, you know the virus sphere is much greater than the biosphere, so I, I, I'm not sure we quite have the uh, capabilities yet of understanding the ecosystems, the virus, the viral, and the bio, uh, how they interact in the environment. I mean, we're just learning as as you know that study on cholera outbreaks uh, has shown us. We're just learning now, um, developing the technologies to be able to assess our environment and understand better uh, the uh, interactions between the different microbes. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Um, the next question is by Dr. Ali. So I'm going to let you unmute yourself as well. Hi there. Yeah. Uh, uh, good evening from South Africa. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my question actually has two sections, but they are related to each other. 
you know, as you showed that umbrella, you know, other people are showing algorithms, different kind of shapes of the factors or rule players in one health. But as you know, as we know, you know, in many countries, it's not possible to act, you know, kind of like a fork in all the directions. You know, the funding is a problem. You come, you know, for instance, you are talking about defecation and, you know, bush, bush kind of urinating and defecation is a big problem in parts of Africa and India. So it's not, it's not possible, you know, to go to all direction. So my question is that, you know, I actually, one suggestion I have is that we need to simplify the methods. For instance, you are talking about microbiome and microbiome research is not possible in many countries. You know, very few countries in Africa are able to do that. So my first, my, uh, my suggestion is that actually uh, professionals of the One Health must come with simplified methods, that methods that are possible for developing countries. That is my, actually, my kind of, uh, my question that why not, why uh, professionals are not coming with such methods instead of just making it so complicated. And the other thing is that yourself, from your own view, if you want to pr prioritize the, the actions, what actions do you think, for instance, the first three action that you think are most important, that countries must invest more on these actions? What are your, uh, the priorities? that you suggest from your own profession? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, those are great questions. Uh, yes, I, I agree that the umbrella was a complicated graphic. And, and in fact, um, I had recommended that they could truncate all of that into three little intersecting bubbles, and they added those three bubbles on top of everything else. So, so yes, they made the graphic very complex and uh, there, there are other graphics that are simpler, uh, you know, human, animal, and environment, and it's just kind of a triangle. And I think that might be an easier graphic to understand than the umbrella graphic. Uh, so I completely agree with you that using a, a simpler graphic would be much better for the general public. I, I think the umbrella graphic was really meant for professionals more than for the general public. Uh, in terms of my priority, um, you know, in, in assessing this whole, this whole challenge, I, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the challenge of fecal waste uh, really has to be a global priority. Um, animal fecal waste, human fecal waste, uh, there's going to be 8 billion humans soon on the planet, and we've got 30 plus billion food animals, and they're defecating. And I don't hear much discussion on dealing with that, trying to reduce fecal contamination on food in waterways, because those are really what are driving the illnesses. Uh, and, you know, as I said, we live in a microbial world. We need to learn to live better in it. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that our fecal wastes aren't contaminating our microbial world in such a way that we're constantly sick. Um, you know, if, if our environment is just packed with fecal waste, um, you know, we're going to be constantly sick. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard arguments, I mean, it's not just fecal waste. I've heard arguments that in 10, 20 years, there's going to be more plastic in our oceans than there These fecal wastes, by the way, are also contributing to greenhouse gases. Uh, they contribute methane and nitrous oxide, which are much more potent than, um, than uh, carbon dioxide. So these fecal wastes are contaminating our soil, our water, and our atmosphere. And, and for me, that's a global emergency that we really need to, to talk about. And we need to develop the technologies, the biotechnologies, uh, there's been some talk about capturing some of the, uh, using the fecal waste to capture some of the gases as fuel, biofuel, for example. Um, so, so there are things that can be done, but I think there, I'm not seeing the level of emergency uh, response to it that, that I think it deserves. So, so thank you for that 
that question. You're spot on on that. Our next question is from Alex Etim, um, and he's not able to ask it himself as well. So the question is, um, Dr. Laura, do you think it is scientifically possible for us to be completely reliant on bacteriophage therapy and for it to completely replace the use of antibiotics? I think um, currently, no. Currently, definitely not. Can we completely rely on it? It is still, uh, I think, very much in the experimental phase. phase. Um, I see great potential for it. Um, I went to a phage or an AMR conference where there were people who were working on phages. And this one uh, researcher was actually doing genetic engineering of phages, making them a little bit more broad spectrum. So I, I think there's a lot of great potential for them. Again, they need to be developed in concert with rapid diagnostics. We need, need much better rapid diagnostics so that uh, we can use them. So I, I view them as green energy of 30 years ago. They have great potential, but they're not ready for prime time. And that's where we are with phage therapy right now. They have great potential, but they're going to require uh, a, at least a decade, I think, of uh, research and development. And, and currently, at least, I know the US federal government is not putting in the funding for it. Uh, it, it's minuscule at best, minuscule. So we're certainly not putting in the funding in that I think it deserves if we really want to make it more of a reality than, than what it is right now. So um, there is growing interest in them, uh, but we still have a long, long way to go. Thank you. And, you know, while we're discussing phage therapy, I actually have a personal question of my own that fits in. So. Um, you know, I was just wondering, do you think that with the advent of alternatives to antibiotics and antimicrobials, including phage therapy, um, do you think that might undermine the importance then of good antimicrobial stewardship if we have such a good alternative? And, you know, if that were the case, then, because I was thinking that if we have more vulnerable populations like rural and poorer communities who may not have access to more modern alternatives like phage therapy in the future, then, you know, if, if we undermine sort of the importance of preserving um, good antimicrobial stewardship, but then having such novel therapies actually have its own limitations and drawbacks as well? Or what do you think in your opinion of that? Um, you know, the interesting thing about phages is that, um, again, they require, at least right now, intensive uh, labor development. Uh, you know, it's a very personalized therapy. And that having been said, um, I foresee, and, and this is just pure speculation on my part, that perhaps we'll have phage uh, therapy centers, you know, in, in both urban and rural areas where people can come in if they have an infection, uh, they can be rapidly diagnosed and then, and then treated with the, uh, the phages there. So, uh, you know, I, I foresee a day where uh, phages will become part of the primary care but um, we're not there. Uh, right now it's very expensive, but um, a lot of them are part of the environment. So if you can develop the technology to isolate them and um, process them uh, in, a, in a very cost-effective way, they could actually become very uh, cheap uh, eventually if, um, if we, have the right technologies to do it. So uh, right now, of course, uh, we're not there yet. So I think, you know, in several decades, it might become very accessible in both urban and rural, depending on how we invest in it. Um, so I'm not sure that's a great answer for you, but... Uh, no, it was just something that I was thinking about. But no, thank you so much for your opinions. I think it's just, it's one of yeah. those things where nobody has the answers to yeah um, definitively but no thank you so much that was really um helpful um so next question sorry dr laura um you you're available to stay for more questions are you just let us know if you have to nip off anywhere and we can conclude it um but if you're happy to we still have a couple more questions coming our way sure thank you so the next question is by alejandra i'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself now if you'd like to ask it 
Hello. Uh, hello, Dr. Hi. Nora. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, my question is, um, why birds they play an important role in the spread of antimicrobial resistant bacteria? Um, we know uh, they have contact with natural and urban environments. And many species have uh, large scale migratory behaviors. In addition to research on this topic, uh, what, are, what other actions or strategies do, do you suggest? Yeah, that, that's a great question because um, they have found wild birds, the, you know, their fecal matter contains resistant microbes and resistant genes. And in fact, they found one seagull in this remote peninsula in Russia with you know, some of the most <laughs> resistant genes you can find. So, so yes, when they migrate, they travel far and wide spreading these things in their fecal matter. Um, so it's a huge challenge. Uh, again, fecal matter, I think, is, is a really key part of this that we generally don't uh, talk about uh, in the whole AMR discussion is, uh, you know, is, is that, that role in, in spreading these genes. Now, how do you contain the fecal matter of wild animals? Well, we still can't really figure out how to deal with the fecal matter of our domesticated animals. So, um, so that it's, it's a huge challenge, uh, but one that I think is really important if we wanna have uh, you know, a sustainable civilization as we move forward. Thank you. Um, so the next question is also by a participant who cannot ask it themselves. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do you think phages could be used for the treatment of non-enteric organisms as well, like pulmonary pathogens? Yeah, so there have been some uh, cures or treatments, effective treatments of people with cystic fibrosis with infections in their lungs with phage therapy. Uh, this was done at the University of Pittsburgh, I believe, and at Yale, I think. Um, where there have been some successes in people with infections, resistant infections who have cystic fibrosis. So yes, uh, there have been some cases of success uh, in pulmonary infections as well. You know, the pulmonary tree is lined with microbes. So, um, you know, again, we don't really understand the biome of the respiratory tract, but um, they've certainly been amenable to phage treatment as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Laura. I think that's all the questions we have answered. Um, the chat was quite busy, so if I missed out your question um, accidentally, just put it in the chat again and we'll keep an eye out in the next couple of minutes. But if not, thank you so much, Dr. Laura. Um, oh, okay. Sure, and I wanna thank everybody for their interest in One Health and, uh, you know, and please help um, spread the One Health word uh, moving forward because I, I think it really is our best strategy for uh, ensuring a sustainable future, both in terms of our health and for the health of our planet. So um, thank you all for your time and attention. It was a pleasure for me to, to speak with you all. It was our pleasure to have you here with us tonight. Um, Dr. Laura, would you be comfortable sharing your email with the participants? Uh, sure. Let me, um, so uh, if you could just drop it in the chat, I think that, um, many of them are very keen to ask questions. And if any of you, you know, you're a bit too shy. If you have questions that surface after, you know, after this meeting ends, you can always direct it directly to Dr. Laura as well. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for being thank here you again. So much. And thank Dr. you, everyone, Laura. for your questions. They were, um, you know, it was really wonderful. And I'm glad that many of you were able to ask your questions directly. Um, so we will, I will end the recording here. And